Thank you very much indeed, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I thought that um, given um, Bright Blue's uh, history and place in the Conservative Party, I thought that I'd come and talk about the importance of optimism and the role of optimism in politics and in particular in Conservative Party politics. And this is true right down to the most um, specific level. I was optimistic, for instance, um, that I'd be able to cross Whitehall despite the fact that the Tour de France is running. And um, I was ultimately proved right, although it took a bit longer than I expected, so I apologize for um, running late. And, um, but the message I wanted to, to, um, to talk about, and the central message, is that I think that optimism, it, it, fits, it fits my character, but it also is absolutely central because we win as a Conservative Party, we win elections when we're being optimistic about Britain. Um, if you think about it, this is true historically. Um, it was true under Macmillan when he said, you've never had it so good. Um, it was true under Margaret Thatcher with her revolutionary zeal. It was always a zeal that said that Britain's best days lie ahead of her. And so we're, when we are telling the story, of Britain on the rise and of Britain where our children can aspire to more than their parents, that is when we take the public with, with us. And um, I am an unremitting optimist. Um, and I think that it's vital that we keep making this argument because we didn't come into government just to clear up Labour's mess, although, of course, that was a crucial part of it and it's something that I continue to repeat. But our long-term economic plan isn't just about economics. It is a moral mission, too, and it's a moral mission about the rise of Britain. Tackling the deficit isn't just about stabilizing the economy. That is true. It is absolutely about stabilizing the economy, but it's much more than that. It's about saying that we are not just an over-indebted ex-power, but rather there is something ahead that can be better for this country, better for our children, and better for our children's children. And likewise, our welfare reforms are not just about saving money, but crucially, they are truly compassionate because they're about an enabling state which has higher hopes for people than just a signature every fortnight. And it's in that spirit of optimism, which is based, I think, on an instinctive trust of human capacity I think it's that optimism that ties our policy threads together. If we look at the electorate, we have great cause to be optimistic. It used to be said that while Margaret Thatcher won all the big economic arguments, she failed to win the culture war. But the evidence increasingly suggests that the tide is turning. And we know from polling data that under 30s are more closely aligned more closely aligned with conservative values than their parents and their grandparents. They're more likely to val value self-reliance over state dependence, being less likely to support higher welfare payments for the unemployed, for example, as one proxy, as one measure of this. They're also more likely to believe that the state taxes and spends so too much and want to keep more of what they earn because they've just because they've had to fight for it. And they're also more socially liberal, but so too is the modern Conservative Party, with support for things like extended paternity leave and gay marriage and tax-free childcare for working families. Yet, yet only 22% of first-time voters polled earlier this year said they'd vote Conservative, compared to 41% for Labour. So we have to earn these votes. Our political task is to convert conservative values into conservative voters. Now, first and foremost, I think that that means policies that deliver for young people. First time voters say that jobs and skills are their top priorities. So maybe that's a reason that I care about this um, so much. Having seen what Labour did to their older brothers and sisters, I can understand why they feel that way. Between 97 and 2010, youth unemployment increased by 40%, and it increased even before the crash. And at least 350,000 teenagers were fobbed off with qualifications which employers didn't respect or need. And I'm sure you'll know what I think of a national scandal, which is the OECD finding 
that young people aged between 16 and 25 are the only young people across the whole of the OECD whose literacy and numeracy skills are less well developed than their grandparents. Now, I think that we then have a strong argument that we're turning this around. Since 2010, we've delivered 2 million more private sector jobs. We're on track to deliver 2 million more apprenticeships by the end of the parliament. We're revolutionizing vocational education so it truly matches university as a route into a good job. And we've done this by quite straightforward and quite conservative principles. For instance, a new test for every vocational qualification asking, is it rigorous? And is it a route into employment? If the answer is no, we've removed public funding. We've rolled out new technical awards, tech levels, new vocational qualifications. These are designed in partnership with employers. And in fact, we brought in what is, on the face of it, a simple test, which is that if these qualifications are to be recognized by the government, then they must have at least five employers, real employers, who recruit young people say in public and sign a letter in public to say that they would value somebody more if they had one of these qualifications. And that led to a 90% drop, a 90% drop in the number of vocational qualifications that we recognize, which is an extraordinary change. And in the whole education system, vocational and more broadly, we're unashamedly on the side of the individual learner, not the education provider. And given schools more autonomy, stronger accountability, League tables now specifically say they measure people by achievement as well as by qualification. What proportion of kids get to university? What proportion get into an apprenticeship? What proportion go into become NEETs? And I think that these league tables will have one of the biggest impacts of our whole education reforms because they will focus schools and colleges on what really matters for young people, which is how the that how what they do at school impacts on where they end up afterwards. And it tackles a key concern that employers raise with me and that the CBI set out last week, which is to make sure that young people leave school and college ready for work. And this agenda is natural Tory territory because it is about earned reward, not something for nothing. And that is the sort of social justice that underpins a centre-right political philosophy. Learning takes grit and graft and application and perseverance and to, do, to learn anything you have to put something in. There are no shortcuts but the rewards are worth it. It is after all through education that we go from being prisoners of circumstance to being captains of our economic fate and so I think that our reforms to schools and to skills are an absolutely essential part of this moral mission. Looking at the labor market, making it easier for businesses to employ people, in making it easier for them to take on school and college leavers, for instance, by abolishing uh, national insurance for the under 21s and reforming employment law, that is a moral mission to try to make it easier for employers to create jobs and take people on. But good policy alone is not enough, and I think that we have an impressive track record. It's not adequate just to talk about the statistics. Without it, our message won't get through. And I brought with me on my very high-tech speech a quote that is a favorite of mine, which is a quote from Robert Kennedy, and he said, GDP measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes your life worthwhile. And younger voters need to know that we're on their side because it's wrong to say that younger voters are simply not interested in politics. It's more accurate to say they're less interested in political parties. Every day we see huge numbers engaging in debate on Twitter, on Facebook, they behave like enlightened consumers. They are focused on specific issues that matter to them. And this is because individual choice, I think, is encoded in the fabric of modern technology and the web, Amazon and iTunes, which offer 
enormous and absolute choice. However obscure your interests happen to be at the click of a mouse or at the press of a button, these sites allow access to virtually anything that markets have to offer. And today's digital news, a whole generation who can't remember a time before the internet, expect the same of their politics, and hence the rise of fringe parties and single-issue campaign groups, because you can be behind an individual campaign without necessarily supporting the party. And it's vital that we communicate with these younger voters, generation right, as some have called them, using modern media. And the great thing about social media is that the electorate can talk back, and it's a dialogue. Now, I think that the party is starting to use this with really great effect. Road Trip 2015, which is a voluntary campaign team. I don't know how many of you here today have engaged in, have been on a Road Trip 2015. It is an essentially a social medium phenomenon taking hundreds, and in some cases thousands of people who are enthusiastic about supporting the party, into the most important battleground seats. The Share Our Facts tool which is a campaign tool on the Conservative website, ensures online activists are armed with the facts they need to make the argument on the big political issues of the day, whether that be on Twitter or on Facebook. And our job is to earn the respect of younger voters, continually, continue to build the youth offer, and communicate with them on platforms that they use, and above all, be relentlessly optimistic. Because our message to young people must be that we want a Britain in which everyone, everyone, can achieve their potential, earn their own success, and share in the recovery that we have built. And let this message go out loud and clear from this conference and from our campaign over the next 10 months, that we have, through tough times, turned the country around, but we're doing it in order to support everybody to reach their potential. Whether you're the sort, and whether you might have gone to university in the past, or whether you want to go into an apprenticeship. And whether you're somebody who voted for us last time or is open-minded, we've absolutely got to campaign on supporting and being on the side of all people, and especially amongst young people, to make sure that they know that they share our values. And it's our campaign over the next 10 months that must do that between now and the next general election. Thank you very much. Thank you.